Greetings and love to all of you. Please stand for opening prayer. Let us turn the attention within. Feel the divine presence and pray from our hearts. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, Mother friend, friend, beloved God, Beloved God. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Bhagavan Krishna, Krishna. Avatar Babaji, Vihiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, Uplift our consciousness. Help us to realize we are your children, made in your divine image of pure consciousness. And bless us that we may realize our oneness with thee and oneness with all life. Again and again, we lay the flowers of our devotion gently at thy feet. Om, peace, amen. Please be seated. We begin all the services with a period of silent meditation. And meditation is one of the few times we have to turn our attention away from the world, turn our attention away from the personal story of the ego and all the drama that goes with that. Turn away from the thoughts, the feelings. In an effort to recognize our real self, that we are children of God, made in the image of that pure divine consciousness. So even in this short meditation this morning, let us enter into it with that attitude of total forgetfulness of everything but that pure awareness, that pure consciousness at the core of our being. Master said, isn't it strange that you do not know who you are? That you do not know your own self? You define yourself by so many different titles applicable to your body and mortal roles. You must peel off these titles from the soul. I think but I'm not the thought. I feel, but I'm not the feeling. I will, but I am not the will. What is left? The you that knows you exist. The you that feels you exist through the proof given by intuition, the soul's unconditional knowing of its own existence. So to begin the meditation, I'll repeat an affirmation, and if you will, mentally repeat after me. And the affirmation is, I am beyond body, thought, and utterance, beyond all matter and mind. I am endless bliss. So after I repeat it a few times and you mentally repeat, continue mentally a few more times and then just dissolve those words into that pure knowing, that pure consciousness, that pure recognition of your own existence. Master says we exist and we're conscious of that existence. So again, in meditation, go beyond the words, beyond what they represent, 
and perceive our true self in that stillness within. So please repeat after me. Mentally, I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. I am beyond body, thought, and utterance. Beyond all matter and mind, I am endless bliss. Continue mentally for a few more times and then go to that stillness. Om Peace Amen Some years ago I called an SRF member and I got his voicemail and the message said Hi, I'm Chris Sorry I can't come to the phone right now I'm too busy counting my blessings I never forgot that. And so today's subject is giving thanks for life's blessings. And, you know, let's take just a moment and just inwardly ask yourself, what is it I really have to, to be thankful for? 
Just take a moment and just ask, what do I really have to give thanks for? What are some of the blessings in my life? Swami Shankara, one of the great sages of India, he said, there are three great blessings. And some of us here, and he enumerated, there were three of them. And some of us here have all three of those great blessings. Some of us here have two of those great blessings. All of us here have one of those great blessings. And the first great blessing he said was to have a human body. And I know some of us may think, well, what's so great about that? It, it sure doesn't seem like it when there's all the aches and pains in it. But the reason having the human form is such a great blessing. If you think about it, it's the only form in all of creation that has the astral anatomy so that the consciousness can return to its source. So man is unique in this way. So this is why Swami Shankara is pointing out it's a great blessing even to have that human form. One of the other great blessings that he talked about was having a true guru. Having a true guru. And again, why is this such a blessing? Well, just as we mentioned, like without the human form, the consciousness can't go back to its source in spirit. And actually, without a true guru, the consciousness cannot go back to its home in spirit. In the Sikh religion, they have a beautiful saying, without the guru, oneself cannot be known. Without the guru, oneself, capital S, one's real self cannot be known. And without the guru, we can't realize our real self. We can't have that final liberation of union with God. And in the SRF lessons, lesson 16, it's, it's all about the guru-disciple relationship. And in lesson 16, Master says, only through the guru-disciple relationship may the human soul retrace its footsteps to God. Because ultimate liberation depends on three factors. The devotee's effort. The help of the guru. And the grace of God. So if any one of those three is missing, we're still not able to merge the consciousness back to the source from which it came. So everyone is able to, to make progress on the spiritual path. But again, they're not able to go all the way without the, two, the true guru. And if you haven't studied that lesson 16, I would encourage you to, to go back and look at that. Study it so you're convinced of the necessity of having a guru. And if you have the guru already, study that lesson with the appreciation for what a blessing it is for what you have. Again from Lesson 16, Master says, An understanding of the divine law of the guru-disciple relationship is necessary. We learn this in India. It is very simple, but very important. You have to find the guru first 
then real spiritual progress begins. You have to find the guru first, then real spiritual progress begins. And the guru is one who is that divine God consciousness that is helping lead us back. There's the saying that water can raise no higher than its source. And so there are teachers that can lift us to, to their level. But the guru can lift us all the way to his level of God consciousness. And one of those great disciples of our guru Paramahansa Yogananda was Rajasi Janakananda. And Master lifted him to the exalted states of God consciousness. And one of the disciples said that he was with Rajasi one time and he could hear Rajasi just quietly saying, what Master has done for me, what Master has done for me. Meaning, had given me, had lifted me to that state of God consciousness, to that divine bliss of the soul. And Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. The Master commented on this. He said, This is a true statement of a guru, and seekers should realize its importance. Every emissary of God has God behind him. The guru does not issue a summon to souls to become his disciples. It is God who calls and ordains that sacred relationship. If you think about how tremendous that is, we have this God consciousness, aware of everything in the universe and beyond. And yet, that God consciousness comes as the guru to take a personal interest in the disciple and lead that disciple back to that same level of God consciousness. Some time ago, I received an email from a devotee who used to come frequently to Hidden Valley. And he said, from the time I first came to Hidden Valley in 1981 till now, Divine Mother and Master have guided and cared for me as no one ever could. To say my life has been blessed is totally inadequate. Torrentially blessed and loved without limit is more like it. One day, I look forward to coming back to Hidden Valley when Divine Mother wills it. Until then, I bow my head in utter gratitude every day for the countless blessings pouring out on me continually. I truly hope everything there is going well and you are in bliss. So this is what one gains by that relationship with the guru. Torrentially blessed and loved without limit. This to me is one of the most beautiful aspects of the guru-disciple relationship. It's hard for us to conceive of such unconditional love. Because usually in human relationships, no matter how deep and sincere the love is, more often than not, there is some, something is expected from that loving relationship. But the guru, he has everything in that God consciousness. He wants nothing from us except to share that God consciousness with us. So his love is complete and unconditional. So hopefully we can see why in these 
three blessings that Swami Shankara mentions that the guru is absolutely necessary for that final freedom and liberation. And this was the, the third great blessing was the desire for liberation. The desire for liberation. We've talked about the necessity of the human body, the necessity of the guru, and God's grace. But as great as those things are, God and Guru cannot give us something we don't want. So there has to be that desire for God, for liberation on our part. Master said, besides attunement with the Guru, there must be day and night a consuming desire for God. The ardor of a thousand million loves must be gathered in your heart for him and the consciousness of urgent necessity. Cry for him constantly. Am I going to find you? I want only you. So again, Master tells us without this kind of urgency, without this real desire for God, for liberation, the, the great ones can't give it to us. They can only give us what we want. Once we make that determination of what we want, then and only then do we open up our consciousness to their blessings. On a deep level, we all have this desire for liberation, for freedom. You look at it, many countries in the world fighting for their freedom. It's just innate because the soul, on that deep level of the soul, we know we should be free. And when it expresses through the, the physical form and our minds, there is still that desire for freedom. But when we talk about that final liberation in spirit, final liberation, ultimate freedom, what are we talking about? I always go back to Swami Sri Yukteswar's definition. He said, liberation is one, when one abandons the vain idea of separate existence of his own self and becomes unified with him, the eternal spirit, God the Father. This unification with God is kevala, liberation the ultimate goal of man. I was talking with one of the, the monks on Friday, and we were talking about how many of us, both lay members and monastics, sometimes miss this most vital point on the spiritual path. And I like the way Sri Yukteswar expresses it, giving up the vain idea of separate existence. This is what the ego wants. The ego wants to keep everything about me and my and mine. It's a very egocentric universe. But that universal consciousness is one with all. It's not constricted to that egocentric universe that most of us live in. So if we're really wanting that liberation, that final freedom, this is where we can start in a very practical level. Not always wanting everything to relate to me. It's all about me and what I want and my opinions. It's always for the greater good. The Upanishads say the self, again a capital S, the self is not known through the study of scriptures, nor through subtlety of intellect, nor through much learning. 
The self is revealed to one who longs to know the self. The self is revealed to one who longs to know the self. So you can see again how all three of these great blessings work together. And hopefully we can see how this desire for God, this desire for liberation is, is also key. And so those that have that desire, they're much blessed. For those that do not have it, it's something you may consider wanting to cultivate. As Master said, just that all-consuming desire, day and night, I want that freedom, I want to know truth, I want to be one with the source from which I came. But again, in addition to these three great blessings, to me there is another blessing that we should all inwardly be on our knees, so to speak, in gratitude for. And this is that we're children of God. We're children of God. We're begat, so to speak, by that divine consciousness, meaning we are that divine consciousness also. This is, I mean, it's a beautiful expression. You know, we're children of God. But again, God is just a three-letter word. What does God mean? What is God? And this, of course, has been uh, probably debated and discussed for millenniums. But from India, they give us what is the essence of God. In India, they have many deities that are approaches to the essence, which is great because we relate in different ways. But what is the essence that these uh, reminders are pointing us to? And their expression is Sat Chit Ananda. And I, to me, this is the most beautiful expression, probably the closest that could ever be put into words as what that ultimate reality, that ultimate truth, that, that God is. Sat Chit Ananda. Sat being existence. And chit meaning conscious, awareness. And ananda, bliss. That peaceful, joyous, blissful consciousness. And if you think about being children of God, it's not that it's something off in the future that we have to recognize that we're children of God. Again, we are, the Guru tells us, individualized Satchitananda. In that little meditation in the beginning, we talked about just becoming aware of your own existence. And this is something that you can do any time, like right now, ask yourself, do I exist? Just take a moment. Do you exist? We all know that we exist. Are you conscious of that existence? Of course you are, or otherwise you wouldn't know you exist. So there's the sat chit. And of course, when I'm stressing this, the question always comes, yeah, but where's the ananda? Where's the bliss? That's always appealing to the mind. 
But as we begin to bring forward the recognition that we are satchit, that we are conscious existence, and we shift that identification away from this body-mind mechanism and begin to recognize we are that pure existence, we are, am that pure consciousness, then great joy comes with that because we recognize we're not dependent on anything outside of our own conscious existence to make us happy. It's just the nature of our own existence. It's so difficult sometimes when we get caught up in all the, the drama of the personal story to realize that we are this divine bliss consciousness now. And again, we, the ego wants to put it something far away that someday we may be able to attain and someday it will come to me. But Master says, no, we are that now. And one of the great expressions of this to me is from the Sufi poet Rumi, the way he put it. I was knocking at the door. The door opened. I found I was knocking from the inside. <laughs> so we are, we're striving, trying to, to, to recognize, get something outside of ourselves when everything we want is that divine consciousness right there within us. The Master makes this point here. Listen to what he says. Be in God bliss. He has made you already what He is. That is what you don't realize because you acknowledge only that you are a human being. You do not know that this thought is a delusion. We focus on the human so much that that's what the consciousness identifies with and then we begin to think that that's what we are. I'm this pure, frail, mortal human being. Think of it sometimes, just we don't have time to now to dwell on every point. But I would encourage you sometimes, you know, to ask yourself, what do I think I really am? What do I think I really am? Am I a body and a mind? Am I uh, a minister, a monk, or the different roles that I play? What am I? Is that what I think I am? Or do I think I'm a child of God? I'm pure divine consciousness, pure awareness that makes me conscious of all of this. It's important how we think of ourselves. Listen to these words of Master. This is one that, if I had to list the top ten of meaningful quotes of Master, this would definitely be in that top 10. He's quoting from the Bible when he says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Whatever way the devotee thinks of himself, free and bondaged, attached, non-attached, restless with passion or free of all desire, that is the consciousness the body-identified soul adopts. Think of yourself as the self. Think of yourself as the self. Find ways to continually bring the thoughts back to who I really am. We all have our own ways of doing this. I was, again, telling one of the monks on, on Friday, one of the most meaningful mantras to me has been, this has nothing to do with me. This has nothing to do with me. What that's doing is pointing the attention back to your real self. Has nothing to do with me, the soul, the child of God, the pure consciousness. It has only to do with a temporary role. Somebody said something I didn't like or I didn't get what I wanted. Those things, they have nothing to do with me. They have nothing to do with me. Use that mantra. It's, it's tremendous. Every time something comes up, it has nothing to do with me. 
It points the attention back. It's affirming what we truly are. We can use that mantra in other ways throughout the day. But for most of us, the, the most effective way of knowing who we truly are is through meditation. In meditation, especially through techniques of meditation that get us into that stillness, we can recognize what we truly are. Master said, I am that which is behind the breath, body, mind, and feeling. We are that self. I am that which is behind the breath, body, mind, and feeling. And that's why in meditation, it gives us an opportunity to recognize that which we truly are. And Master, again, has given those meditation techniques to help us. And for those that enter that guru-disciple relationship, they, the guru gives his gift to help the, help the disciple recognize that divine consciousness beyond the breath, the body, and the mind, and feelings. And the guru in Self-Realization Fellowship gives that technique of Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga helps to take us beyond the body, the breath, the mind. And this is why Master said, after Kriya, sit a long time in the stillness. After Kriya, sit a long time in the stillness. We want to go behind even those subtle perceptions that are often there in meditation and recognize what is aware of even those subtle perceptions. The pure consciousness, the pure awareness. Again, Master said, yoga meditation is the process of cultivating and stabilizing the awareness of one's real nature through definite spiritual and psychophysical methods and laws by which the narrow ego, the flawed hereditary human consciousness, is displaced by the consciousness of the soul. Master mentions this stabilizing the consciousness in this meditative state, in that peace, in that joy, in that sense of freedom. But we need to stabilize that consciousness beyond sitting on the meditation seat. We need to stabilize that consciousness throughout the day. You can think of it as stabilizing. I know the Lord Krishna, he said, become anchored in that which is changeless. So be, having the consciousness anchored in that peace, that sense of freedom throughout the day. So we don't get overly drawn into to the drama. So think of it. You can come up with your own words. Stabilizing the consciousness, you know, anchoring the consciousness in it integrating that consciousness into your daily life. So meditation is where we first, for most of us, are first going to, to touch that, that stillness, that recognition of our real self behind all the drama of life. But even that's not enough. We have to, as Master said, stabilize, bring that into our, our everyday activity. Sri Mata said, the more we become anchored in our real self, the more we immerse ourselves in God's presence within. Drunk with one drive, one hunger, one desire, God alone. The more we understand what reality is, the entire being becomes absorbed night and day in one thought, God. So, I would urge us all to, outside of meditation, try to 
to do things with a quiet mind. When we have that quiet mind, we have a greater appreciation for things. We see things as they are. We see the beauty, the intelligence, the, the balance of things. One little experience that, that just highlighted that for me was years ago at our Hidden Valley Ashram, we had a three-hour meditation on a Saturday morning. And after it was over, I was walking back to my room and at a little crevice in the sidewalk, I looked down and there was a tiny little mouse. And you could tell he was like newborn because his little paws uh, were really pink and he, his ears were disproportionately large for a tiny little body and a little nose. And I just knelt down and I was looking at this little creature. And a couple of other guys were passing by nearby and I just motioned for them to come over. And I, I just pointed to, I looked up at them and I pointed and they looked down and they said, oh yeah, it's a mouse. And they turned around and walked off. And I thought, they didn't even see it. They didn't even see it. This is the essence of mousiness. <laughs> and, and they missed it. When we, and coming out of meditation, my mind was still quiet, so I was blessed to see the essence of mousiness. But this is when we can go through the day with a quiet mind. We recognize so much more. We have a natural appreciation for so much more. It's wonderful to, to be grateful for the things we have in our lives, the, the friends, the, the house, the financial security, the food on the table, all of these things. We should be grateful for them. But I would encourage you to think deeper and give gratitude for those more profound things in your life, even your own existence. So, you know, let's not just give thanks for, for what we have, but for what we are. We're children of God. We, we are that divine consciousness. What could be greater? So if you will, close your eyes and listen to these words from the Upanishads. From joy we have come. In joy we live, move, and have our being. And in that sacred joy, we melt again. From joy we have come. In joy we live, move, and have our being. And in that sacred joy, we melt again. Let's spend a few minutes deeply praying for others and for world peace. This is another great way of forgetting ourselves. Oftentimes we're praying for what we want, what we feel we need. But just occasionally try to feel the needs of others. Asking God and Guru to, to bless them. To use us as a humble channel to, to send light and healing vibrations to those in need.
Let us now stand and have our healing service. Let us pray together. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies, in their minds, in their souls. Let us raise the arms and chant Om for the healing of the body. Om. For the mind. Om. For soul realization. Om. And once more for world peace and brotherhood. Om. Now let us have our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Gurus of Self-Realization Fellowship, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, Bless me that I recognize more and more that I am your child, made in your image of divine consciousness. You are the ocean of consciousness. I am your wave. Bless me that I may realize in an ever greater way that thou and I are never apart. I lay the flowers of my devotion and gratitude gently at thy feet. Om. Peace. Amen.